This is session number 14 of our study of the book of Revelation. It is January the 9th, 2013. It's hard to believe, but uh, here we are. So we are in Revelation chapter 8, beginning in verse 2. We're on page 44 of the notes. But let's kind of just get up to speed with what's going on. <clears throat> chapters 6 through 19 of the book of Revelation are prophecy of the future time that's coming called the tribulation. So chapter 6 to 19, the majority of the book, are dealing with this period of the tribulation. That will begin after the rapture of the church, after the Lord uh, takes uh, uh, takes the uh, church, the believers, uh, home to be with him. And um, that uh, will precede this seven years of tribulation. And Revelation, the book of Revelation uh, reveals the prophecy of these seven years uh, in, in a very unique way. Uh, there is, first of all, the opening of seven seals of a scroll. And the, the scroll was rolled up and it had coming down uh, where, the, where the edge of the scroll is seven seals to keep someone from, who's unauthorized from opening this. And one by one they are opened and the Lord is the one who has the authority to open them. And uh, each seal reveals uh, something that's going to happen during this period of the tribulation. The last seal is going to actually, instead of being one prophecy, is going to then be seven trumpets. When each trumpet is blown, there is going to be uh, another unveiling of prophecy of the tribulation period. When the seventh trumpet is blown, it's going to then be seven bowls of wrath that are going to be poured out. So three sets of sevens to give us uh, the, the picture of what's going on during the period of the tribulation. In the opening of these seals, the first five seals were a false peace, war, famine, death, and the vengeance of God. And uh, they describe the preliminary judgments that occur uh, in the first part of the tribulation. Then, when we get to the sixth of the seals, we move into the second half of the seven years of tribulation. And uh, this is the section that we are in now. And uh, this is the time of what's called in the Bible the pouring out of God's wrath. Is the second half of the tribulation, and it is called the Great Tribulation. So tonight uh, we are in chapter 8. Uh, we're going to start in verse 2, but we'll probably read verse 1 just to bring us up to speed. But here it begins those seven, or excuse me, the six trumpet judgments. And so the six seals have been opened. And then the seventh seal is opened, which introduces us to the trumpets. So now we have uh, started to, in chapter 8, verses 1 to 6, with the seventh seal opened. And so we'll just read verse 1, which we studied last week. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half hour. And last week we ended with talking about how noisy the worship in heaven was up to this point. Chapter 4, 5, 6, 7 have all had scenes of worship in heaven. And it's loud as they are praising God. It is very striking that all of a sudden there is silence for a half hour. It's hard for us when there's 30 seconds of silence. But to, for a whole half hour of silence, and apparently, there's no explanation for it, but apparently it is uh, just, it's kind of like the silence in a courtroom where uh, the verdict is about to be announced and the jury comes out and everything is place, in place and it's, and it's a silence of expectation. And that seems to be what's going on here. Uh, 
So then we pick up in verse 2, chapter 8, verse 2, page 44 of, of the notes. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Now, the, the word the, I saw the seven angels, that sets this apart from other angels that we have seen. They are a unique group. And you know, in the Bible, there are descriptions of ranks of angels. There are archangels, there are seraphim, there are cherubim, there are thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, powers. All those terms are used in different places in the Bible for different ranks of angels. This, as far as we know, is still another rank of angels. Uh, four, uh, or excuse me, seven uh, unique angels. And uh, they stand before God. They are there waiting for orders. And uh, they're worshiping God, and they're waiting for orders. And, uh, and then here are the seven trumpets that are given to them. So they are going to be the ones that will blow these trumpets, which will unveil for us different aspects of what's going to happen in the Great Tribulation. Verse 3. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. And he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. So the scene here is in heaven. And as we've seen before, the scene in heaven is the scene of a temple that there is, God has a temple in heaven. The Jewish temple in Jerusalem was patterned after this temple in heaven. And you remember studying about the tabernacle and then the temple, that there were two altars uh, in the tabernacle and in the temple. One was made out of brass and it was in the courtyard and it was where the sacrifices were, were brought and offered to the Lord. There was a, a golden altar inside the building of the temple that stood right in front of the veil. On, and on the other side of the veil was the Holy of Holies. So the closest thing to the Holy of Holies was this golden altar. It's called the altar of incense. This is the altar that's here. And uh, as this uh, altar is is uh, described, it's um, uh, this altar with this censer, golden censer. A censer was a container that uh, was used for holding burning coals from the altar, and it would have on it uh, some incense, and that incense would get hot, and it would burn, and it would send off smoke. And with that smoke, it would send an aroma. And this was a picture in the temple of the prayers of God's people. Uh, we know that uh, because of Psalm 141 verse 2, for instance, talks about this. And uh, so here in, in this heavenly temple, he sees the golden uh, censer and uh, with much incense. And so this incense was dumped on the coals and uh, the smoke would arise. And every morning, every evening, a priest would come into the temple and he would uh, bring the incense and he would uh, uh, put the incense on the coals. And every morning and every evening there would be the sweet smell of incense and it would be speaking of the prayers of the people. And then while that smoke was going up, the priest would pray for the people of Israel. Uh, this is what the priest Zacharias was doing uh, when the angel appeared to him with the announcement that he and his wife Elizabeth are going to have a baby. That would be John the Baptist, the forerunner of the Messiah. John the Baptist's father was a priest doing this very thing at that time. And the picture is that when we pray, uh, it is a sweet smell uh, to God. And it also reminds us that God answers prayer. 
And sometimes we get discouraged, and, uh, but we should never be discouraged about God answering prayer because this was done constantly, every morning, every evening, and a reminder that uh, it may go kind of slow from our point of view, but in God's time, he does answer those prayers. Now, there's a particular prayer that's involved here, and it's the prayer of the martyrs. It's the prayers of those who have, who have been killed because of their faith in Jesus Christ during the tribulation. And we've, we've seen this before. Uh, you remember, there will be believers during the tribulation, not us, because we will be caught up in the air with, with being part of the church prior to the tribulation. But last week we studied in chapter 7 that God is going to seal 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Uh, after the, the rapture, 144,000 Jewish people are going to believe in Jesus. They're going to be the preachers that are going around the world that are witnessing, sharing the gospel. Many of the people who come to faith during the tribulation, not the 144,000, they have a seal from God that prevents them from being killed. But many of those who come to faith through their testimony will be martyred. And the, these martyrs have been seen earlier in the book and they are crying out, Lord, how long, how long until you bring judgment on your enemies and those who persecute your people? And that's the particular prayer that, that is being pictured here as going up before the Lord. And that is the prayer of those who have been killed because of their faith in Christ. And calling on God to, to, to bring judgment on his enemies. That is the prayer that's going to be answered with the rest of the trumpets and the bowls of wrath. Uh, through, uh, through to the end of the tribulation. So, uh, these are, are believers. They are called in verse 3, given much incense to offer uh, with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. So, the believers who are in heaven are praying. Many of those believers are the martyrs. And they're praying, Lord, uh, bring judgment. Now, we're going to be in heaven as well. And uh, we're going to be praying, Father, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Now, that probably will be the heart uh, of, of our prayers. And uh, these prayers are going to be answered. So verse 4. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of, an, of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. The idea of throwing this fire on the earth is the idea that judgment is about to come to the earth in answer to the prayers. The prayers, particularly the martyrs, have been, God, bring judgment on your enemies. That prayer is going to be answered in what we are going to see in the blowing of those seven trumpets. And uh, so it is, the fire was thrown to the earth and the prayers of the martyrs will be answered. By the way, that prayer of the martyrs is back in chapter 6, uh, verses 9 through 11. Chapter 6, verse 9, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, and so on and so on. So that is, that is the prayer of the martyrs, and that is the prayer uh, that, is, uh, that is being answered here. Then in verse 6, now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. So turning the page, we then uh, come 
to be the first trumpet. And the first trumpet reveals to us the earth smitten. That's chapter 8, verse 7. Now the purpose of these judgments on the earth is certainly it involves judgment. But wherever there is judgment, there is behind it the desire that through that it would lead people to repentance. And that's still true here. It, it, it's true today, and it will be true during the tribulation. Hold on to, uh, to uh, chapter 8 and turn to chapter 9, verses 20 and 21. John 9, or Revelation 9, 20 and 21. Uh, talking about after some of these terrible things happen, the rest of mankind, in verse 20, who were not killed by the plagues, did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols and so on. We'll get to these verses. But there you see the, the, the presentation of the fact that behind this is God's desire that people repent even during this tribulation period. But the tragedy is that even then, people don't repent. And uh, they go their own way. So look at verse 7. The first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown down upon the earth. Now, remember that these judgments had been held back in chapter 7, verse 3, until the servants of God could be sealed. Uh, that, that was part of God's grace. Back in chapter 7, we, we time-wise, we were ready to progress to this point. But they were restrained from doing that until God sealed the 144,000 Jewish evangelists so that they would not be killed in what's, what's happening here. And uh, these uh, judgments are going to hit the earth just at the same time that the non-believers are crawling out of the caves and the rocks that they crawled into trying to hide uh, from the very wrath of God during the sixth seal. Turn back to chapter 6, verses 15 and 17. Just to refresh our memory on this, chapter 6, verse 15. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful, uh, no repentance among them, but they are the rich and the powerful and so on, and everyone slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the, And then here's the... Uh, uh, final statement for that great day of their wrath has come and who can stand so previously all these people when these things were happening on the earth ran for cover now they're crawling out of their cover and look what comes and that's in verse 7 you have the hail and the fire mixed with blood now from a scientific viewpoint, this hail and fire, uh, scientists say that, for instance, a, an 8.5 earthquake would trigger worldwide volcanic eruptions. And in the sixth seal, back in, uh, in, a, in the previous chapter, uh, there is a huge earthquake. So some people, see this uh, hail and fire as being the volcanic eruption which uh, comes as a result of the earthquakes in the sixth seal. And then uh, besides spewing vast quantities of lava, which could be blood red in appearance uh, into the atmosphere, uh, it would, scientists say that then could produce hail and um, violent thunderstorms unlike anything that there has ever been. Uh, 
That is, is a possibility of, of what's going on here. But notice that it says, hail and fire mixed with blood. Um, many view that, that there will be many who die at the time of this devastation. I think that is uh, the correct view. Other people say that the dust and the gases uh, and, and so on uh, will just have that blood red appearance and that's what he's talking about. But John doesn't say it was like blood. He says that it was blood. And uh, by the way, combining fire and blood uh, brings to mind a prophecy in the Old Testament in the book of Joel. Joel chapter 2 verse 3, verse 30, Joel 2.30. The prophet Joel prophesied to Israel of a coming day of the Lord in which uh, there would be fire and blood. That's exactly uh, what's going to happen here. So it continues that these were thrown upon the earth. Not just fall, but thrown. That's the idea of God's omnipotent power. This isn't just some happen happenstance. This is God's direct intervention of judgment uh, onto the earth. And uh, some of the effects of it, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. Now, some people see a contradiction because at the time of the fifth trumpet, there will be grass, because grass is referred to. It's in chapter 9, verse 4. And that could be possible because of the time lapse between this and that later trumpet. Or it, it could be that um, when this happens on the earth in a third, as it says, uh, excuse me, and all the green grass was burned up, um, you know, the earth is in two different hemispheres. And when it's summer here, it's winter in the southern hemisphere and so on. Part of the earth, when this happens, is going to be in winter. And the grass would be dormant and uh, not affected by it. So there are explanations how there could be grass later on uh, in, that, uh, in chapter 9, verse 4. Well, then he goes on in verse 8, and we have C, the second tr trumpet, the sea is smitten. So the earth is smitten in the first one. Now we have the sea is smitten in verse 8. And the second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the th sea became blood. Now, a great mountain burning with fire probably is describing a meteor, something like that. And, and even in our time, uh, there are people that worry about a meteor heating, hitting the earth. You hear of that from time to time. Something like that is going to happen during the period of the tribulation with the sec second uh, trumpet. So this mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And uh, the effect of that is just going to spread over the whole earth. And uh, it says a third of the sea became blood. Now many people might say, well, that's the ocean. At least the fresh water is safe. Well, hold on. Wait for the third trumpet, which is D, the waters smitten, verses 10 and 11. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven. So another celestial body, could be again a meteor or some other, some other celestial body, uh, fell from, from heaven, blazing like a torch. And the ancient people spoke of a meteor as being like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. So you've got the ocean water is affected, fresh water is affected, 
I mean, this is a serious catastrophe. Then we come to D, uh, the third trumpet, the waters smitten. Uh, uh, well, I already read verse 10, then verse 11, continuing that. The name of the star is wormwood. Now, wormwood is a bitter plant that grows in the, in the desert. And it can um, be kind of like um, horseradish, that kind of thing. And it is a symbol in the Old Testament for God's punishment. For instance, the Old Testament prophets said that God would give his people wormwood to drink if they turn their backs on him. Talks about that in Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 13 to 16. And in that context, God did it uh, with, for Israel with the coming of Babylon when they destroyed uh, Jerusalem and destroyed Israel and so on. So it's, it's, it's used several times in the Old Testament as this description of, of the bitterness of God's judgment. And, uh, you know, the, the term wormwood has come into one of our most loved hymns. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Has that phrase in it about wormwood sinners whose love can ne'er forget the wormwood and the gall. Go spread your trophies at his feet and crown him Lord of all. So even in, in one of my favorite hymns, could be your, one of your favorites too, uh, it, it uses that expression of wormwood from the Old Testament, speaking of this bitterness of the judgment that God brings. And of course, for the believer, we have been delivered out of that, and that is something we rejoice that we are through with. But in this case, uh, it is there for the non-believing world. So the star is called Wormwood. And a third of the waters became Wormwood. Can you imagine going for a glass of water and it tastes like that? And um, many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. A terrible, terrible catastrophe uh, on the earth. Well, turning the page, page 46, I believe that's the first page on, the, on your notes on the table tonight. The fourth trumpet, the heavens are smitten. That's chapter 8, verses 12 and 13. Verse 12, the fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck. Somehow, some way, it's no problem for God, but he's going to reduce the intensity of the sun by a third. Now, every once in a while, uh, you may hear someone talking in scientific terms about uh, how just in perfect symmetry all of God's creation is, and you'll hear the description, if the sun were any closer to us, we would burn up. If the sun were any further away from us, we would freeze. But can you imagine if the, th if the sun's intensity went down by a third, how that would affect? And that's, that's what this is saying. A third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. And then verse 13. Then I looked, and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Some people get wild with prophecy. And there are people who have taken this verse and said, the eagle represents the United States of America. There it is in prophecy. No, don't believe it. Has nothing to do with the United States and our national bird being an eagle. The eagle, as it's being talked about here, is a bird of prey. And this bird of prey is rushing to consume its victims. That's, that's the picture here. It's part of the picture of judgment. And as it cries overhead with a loud voice, it flew directly overhead. The, that is, 
in a position where everyone can see it as it is directly overhead. And here's what it's crying. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are, are about to blow. Now the term woe, W-O-E, is a sound of exclamation saying that something awful is about to happen. When this word woe appears in scripture, it has that idea, something awful is about to happen, particularly uh, in regards to the judgment of God. And so it is used throughout scripture as an expression of judgment and destruction and condemnation. And so there are three woes here, one for each of the remaining uh, trumpet blasts. And this is a warning uh, that's out there for all who dwell on the earth. That expression, all who dwell on the earth, is a technical term in the book of Revelation for uh, all of those who reject the gospel. There is this warning for all those on the face of the earth who are rejecting the gospel. These people are unrepentant even though they acknowledge that the disasters are coming from God. Because remember those verses we looked up in chapter 6 when they went into the holes and the caves and they acknowledged in their cry that these were coming from God and, and, and yet they, they won't repent. And so these three trumpets yet to go are going to be even worse. So we have F, the fifth trumpet, People smitten. That's chapter 9, verses 1 to 12. You know, Satan is real. He's not fiction. And he is powerful. But he's also on a leash. Uh, God does not allow Satan to go beyond a certain limit in afflicting this earth and afflicting uh, God's people and so on. A great example of that is in the Old Testament book of Job. God uh, is, is there in chapter 1 and Satan appears before him and he says, now, you know, God, God points out Job and, and Satan says, just let me get my hands on him and, and we'll see how much Job will really trust you. But God won't let Satan go to the furthest degree. He has a limit on what, uh, what Satan can do. Uh, during the tribulation, Satan's leash is going to be lengthened. He's going to be allowed by God to do things beyond what he's been able to do uh, so far. And that attack is coming in the fifth and sixth trumpets. So let's look at this, chapter 9, verse 1. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth. And he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. Now, this star is not like the star in the previous uh, chapter, which could be a meteorite or, or something like that. Uh, this star in this passage is called a hymn. This star has intelligence. So this star is not some created heavenly body. And this star is, as we're going to see, I saw a star fallen from heaven um, the idea there of fallen, it's the idea he is said to have fallen. It's not that he's falling at this moment, but he, ha he is one who has already fallen prior to this. There's one being that fits that, and that is Satan. That Satan is the one portrayed by this star. How can I say that? Well, turn back to the book of Isaiah in the Older Testament. Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14 is one of two places in the Old Testament 
that we have uh, presented to us uh, the fall of Satan. Satan was originally created as an angel, the most glorious of all of the angels. But Satan, his name then was Lucifer, which means light bearer, and he's described as the most beautiful of all the creation that God made. Uh, yet he was lifted up in pride. Satan's, or Lucifer's job was to bring worship to God. And Lucifer began to say, you know, I'm tired of taking everyone else's worship to God. I would like to keep some of it for myself. It's kind of like a bank teller who is used to every day people bring in money and they bring it to the bank teller and the teller puts it in the bank and it belongs in the account and so on. But when the teller one day decides, I think I'd like some of that money for myself, that teller gets in trouble. And Satan wanted some of that worship for himself. He's lifted up in pride, first time pride appeared in God's creation, and he fell into sin, and he fell literally. So, um, two, two passages in the Old Testament describe that. One is Isaiah 14, the, either, the other is Ezekiel 28. I always remember that by the fact that 28 is two times 14. One's in, in Isaiah, one's in Ezekiel. That helps me to remember it. But anyway, look at Isaiah 14, verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven. So there's that expression, fallen. O day star, son of dawn, and all that has to do with his name of Lucifer. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. That's the first time any other will appeared in God's creation other than God's will. That is when Satan said, I will, instead of God's will be done. I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. Stars of God is a term that's used in the Old Testament, sometimes for angels. And that's probably how the word is being used here. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the Mount of Assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. That's the origin of Lucifer's sin. And so in verse 15, But you are brought down to Sheol to the far reaches of the pit. So, Lucifer has fallen. Well, turning back to, um, well, actually, let's turn to Luke. Luke chapter 10. Gospel of Luke chapter 10. Jesus speaks of this. Luke chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. Jesus had sent 72 uh, disciples out to preach and to minister in villages all around Galilee. And uh, he gave them the power to do miracles, including casting out demons. And in chapter 10, verse 17, the 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he, that is Jesus, said to them, I saw, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That, again, that is referring to Satan's fall when he sinned. Jesus, who is eternal, said, I saw that. Like lightning has the idea of so speedy, so fast, boom, he was out of there when he sinned in his heart. And so this idea of Satan falling is, is biblical terminology. By the way, um, when Jesus said this, I saw Satan fall from, like lightning from heaven. It's in the context of, of these people saying, and wow, you know, we even saw, saw 
demons cast out and so on in Jesus and bringing this up about Satan and that he saw Satan fall is bringing up and saying and Satan is falling today in the sense that his kingdom's falling apart as, as God's people are out there uh, working. But primarily it's talking about uh, the fall from heaven. Now, when Satan fell from heaven, he did still have access to heaven. We know that because of the book of Job. He didn't dwell in heaven, but he did have access to come to heaven. And he accused Job. And by the way, he still does that today. He accuses the brethren. John in 1 John talks about uh, the accuser of the brethren accusing us but when he does we have an advocate with the Father uh, the Lord Jesus Christ but during the tribulation and we're going to see this in chapter 12 when we get there during the tribulation Satan is going to be ultimately cast out of heaven it's in chapter 12 verses 7 and 9 Satan and his demons are going to be in a battle with Michael and, and the angels and they're going to be permanently thrown out of heaven. But uh, turning back here to uh, chapter 9 verse 1, all of this is background. For I saw a star fallen from heaven. So it's not that the star that Satan fell at that moment, but the one who has previously fallen, that particular star, that particular being, Satan, to him was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. Now, the key has the idea of authority and power. When you have the key to something, you have the power and the authority to unlock the door, unlock the building, unlock the treasure chest, whatever. Uh, that gives you some, some authority. Now, Satan does not have the key to hell. And that's not what this is talking about. Some people have the mistaken idea that Satan runs hell. Uh, there is nothing further from the truth than that. Satan is the chief victim in hell. This is not hell. This is something different. This is called the bottomless pit. In, uh, in, in Greek, the word is abyss, A-B-Y-S-S. -S -S. And it is a place of severe torment. Now, I know hell is a place of torment, but this is, this is distinct from hell. Hell is eternal. Uh, we'll go, that is, we'll go on forever. Uh, but um, this uh, will have a limited time. There are some demons imprisoned in the abyss that is called the bottomless pit. It's really a poor name for it because for a pit to be bottomless gives you the idea of something that just isn't possible. Well this is real and so on and, and really the Greek word abyss is, it gives a better idea. It's not something without a bottom it's just this terrible terrible place that is this abyss. There's a particular a t particular um, um, group of angels uh, who are here. Uh, they are the angels who cohabited with women in Genesis 6. I don't know if you're familiar with that. We won't take time to go into all the details of that, but in Genesis 6, it talks about a terrible thing that happened. It was part of, of the progression of sin that got so bad leading up to the, to the flood in Noah's day. And it talks about that the sons of God cohabited with the daughters of men. Now, there are two different interpretations of that. One of the interpretation is that those were human men and human women. Um, the other interpretation is that term sons of God is a term that can refer to angels and demons. It does in some other places. And that it is referring to demons that, that came trying to disrupt uh, 
God's plan of sending the Savior. They tried to, tried to corrupt the human race to make it into a, not, a, a no longer entirely human race but a mixture of demonic and human and somehow trying to stop God's plan of salvation. And it was a despicable thing that was done. God brought terrible, terrible judgment on it. And those demons were put in judgment by being sent to this place that's called the abyss and the um, uh, a bottomless pit. Uh, hold on to Revelation, just to give you some verses on this. First uh, Peter chapter three. First Peter chapter three, verses eighteen, nineteen, and twenty. First Peter three, eighteen. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. In the spirit. So with that in mind, he says, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. So between the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ, while his body was in the tomb, uh, his spirit came here to this place and proclaim to the spirits in prison. Spirits is a term that can be referring to angels or demons. Here it refers to demons. Verse 20, because they formally did not obey God, did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. So at the time of Noah's flood, these demons were judged and sent to this place. That's this verse, it doesn't, it doesn't give all the details, and it's kind of uh, shadowy, but when you put these verses with others, you get the fuller picture. Another place would be 2 Peter, so we were in 1 Peter, then turn to 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. 2 Peter 2.4 For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell. Now, most translations have the word hell there. The ESV does. I'm not sure what the New American Standard in hell. NIV, anyone have NIV? I'm not sure what the NIV does. The Greek word there is not the Greek word for hell. It's a Greek word that's only used here in the New Testament, Tartarus, T-A-R-T-A-R-U-S. Tartarus was a term in Greek mythology that referred to a place like the bottomless pit or the abyss. So I believe this is talking about this abyss and these are the demons that are there. So he cast them into the abyss and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. So at the final judgment, Satan and demons will be judged and cast into hell. But these demons, until that time, are put in this special place of judgment for demons. Now, apparently, they are not the only demons that are there. That there are other demons who have been cast there, but we are not given any explanation about that uh, anywhere else in Scripture. And the reason I say there have to be some other demons there is because those demons involved in Genesis 6, it says, are kept in chains until the judgment. But we're going to see in chapter 9, verse 1, that there are some demons who are there who are going to be let out. God's going to lengthen Satan's leash long enough that he's given the key and he's able to let out some of his demons.
Uh, that's, that's where we're going with this. Well, let's come back to Revelation chapter 9, verse 2. He, so that would be the star fallen from heaven, which would be Satan, opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke, like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke uh, from the shaft. So this is a picture of something dark. Anytime you have Satan involved, you can expect it's, it's dark, it's gloomy, it's, it's bad. And in verse 3, then, now let's uh, turn the page, by the way, to page 47, just so we all stay on the same page. It's where I am, ch chapter 9, verse 3. Then, and so the picture here, think about if all the jail cells in Orange County and Southern California were opened and all those who are incarcerated were allowed to come out, I, I think we'd have some problems around, don't you? Well, that's not anything compared to what's going to happen on the earth when the abyss is opened. And so then from the smoke came locusts on the earth. Now, people in New Testament times knew a lot about locusts. And they were all negative. They were used to plagues of locusts. Locusts just would, the sky would be full of locusts and they would come and they would just strip the crops and produce uh, hunger and poverty and so on. And so the picture here, it's not just one or two demons, but it's as if the sky is full of locusts because these locusts refer to demons. Now, um, the description that you're going to run into here of these locusts quickly shows us that it's not literal locusts. Uh, when, when you have a description of something that then the description is something very different than what they were called, you then get the idea, well, this was, they were called locusts to picture something, but they are something else. These are demons. It's a demon onslaught that's going to come on the earth. And, um, and by the way, the, using the term of locusts is certainly appropriate from the standpoint of, of Old Testament. Because God often in the Old Testament spoke of locusts as being used by him of judgment uh, on the Jewish people if they wouldn't obey him. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 38 and 42 do that. Uh, the book of Joel, two whole chapters describe a locust invasion, Joel 1 and 2, uh, as, as a picture of the judgment that God was going to bring on them. So it, um, it is a, an, an appropriate term when someone is familiar with the pictures of judgment in the Old Testament to call these locusts. But we know that they cannot be lo literal locusts because they have scorpions' tails. No locust has a scorpion's tail. And these locusts don't eat the green vegetation. All locusts go after the green vegetation. So these are, are something far different. They're demons. So these locusts came on the earth and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. And the scorpion, uh, the scorpions that they would be thinking of, they had a tail that, uh, that uh, had venom in it that was very painful and very, very dangerous. It is said that victims of scorpions would, would uh, roll around on the ground in agony and they would foam at the mouth and they would grind their teeth in pain. That's what people in John's day would think of when they would think of of having the affliction of, of scorpions. So these, these locust scorpions or demons are going to afflict people in a terrible, terrible way. Verse 4, they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant 
or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Who's that? That's the 144,000 that we met in chapter 7. This is part of God's protection so that they will survive the tribulation, live through the tribulation. Verse 5, they were allowed to torment for five months. Can you imagine? Five months of this demonic onslaught. Not just an onslaught of demons uh, spiritually and mentally, but physically as well. It's interesting uh, the, with the picture of, of locusts here, the normal cycle of locusts was five months. A cycle of, uh, of coming and destroying the crops and, and leaving and so on typically would be a period of five months. So they were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. They uh, just would have all of this pain and suffering and, and so on. Verse 6, And in those days people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. It's going to be a terrible, terrible time. Well, that's a bad spot to stop, but um, it is a good spot in the progression of, of what's going on here. So we'll pick up next week in, uh, in verse 7, and um, that will be the, thir uh, the 16th. But uh, you get the picture. These are not pleasant days. But God is not willing that any should perish. And he longs for these people to repent. But they don't. Well, let's pray. Father, how we do thank you for being able to study this. We know it's not a happy subject. But it does lead us to the fact that you are sovereign that you will not let things go on the way they are. That there will come judgment on this earth. And Father, we thank you that we live in the day of salvation that precedes that period of judgment. And Father, we pray that we would see more and more people come to faith in Christ. And that the door of salvation is truly open, just as the door to Noah's ark was open. And so, Father, we pray that um, even these days you would give us the privilege to share the gospel and that people's hearts would be turned towards you, that you would bring a harvest. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.